We are concluding our presentation with China. Uh, Professor Fred Duby, a native of Canada, was educated in Canada, Switzerland, Thailand, the United Kingdom, and Austria. And after his career in, in business, he joined the United Nations. Uh, where he was, he served the United Nations Global Compact initially as senior officer, executive office of the Secretary General uh, under Secretary General Kofi Annan and subsequently as senior advisor, United Nations Global Compact. He teaches at several universities and schools and is very active in various initiatives of which some of which you will present uh, better than I could. Uh, his talk, uh, his contribution to this conversation focuses on, um, I cannot pronounce it, so the idea of a harmonious society, China, deep culture, empowerment and collaboration. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, this conference started off uh, when the rector mentioned the 50th anniversary of the encyclical Popularum Progressio. And I have to very humbly say that today is also the 50th anniversary of something very special of uh, our marriage, my wife who's sitting here. <laughs> and, and in 50 years, maybe in one instant, one learns a lot about harmony. One also learns a lot about challenges. Uh, 10 years ago today, I was invited to speak at the Great Hall of the People in uh, Beijing on the topic of the development of a harmonious society and the role of business, and specifically the role of business in the area of human rights, labor rights, environment, and the fight against corruption. And my wife and I were together in the Great Hall of the People. So this is 10 years and, and another Great Hall, which is, I think, Aula Magna, it means Great Hall. Uh, and I have to say not only thank you to the organizers, but above all, how awed I am by each and every one of the presentations that have been shared with us over the last day and a half. And I think what I will try to, to share with you uh, does not disagree with anything that we have heard today and I think supports much of what has been shared with us. I'd like to first of all start by asking you to accept the greetings from Dr. Zhou Jin Feng, the Secretary General of the Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation and the co-author of this paper. Uh, Dr. Joe and I have agreed that the first person singular will be used in the, this afternoon and ask you to understand that this is really a joint paper where almost two decades of joint efforts across a number of fields and joint excursions on less traveled roads ensure that the diversity of culture, background and experience between us two contribute to harmony and all, in all we shall try to share with you today. To contribute to the discussion on the theme of our conference, Integral Human Development, Challenges to Sustainability and Democracy, over the next precious minutes, I propose uh, to explore towards Xiao Kang, the word you were having problem with, and we'll talk about that later, uh, and a harmonious society, China's deep culture, empowerment, and collaboration. Please understand that my vantage point is one of an observer who will try to share some thoughts and personal experiences that will hopefully sum with all we have been privileged to receive over the past day and a half into a powerful set of, set of thought starters 
that one way or another will lead through your teaching, writings, and initiatives to meaningful actions. I propose to divide my chat into four interlocking mini chapters. The first contradiction, then outcomes and implications, three little cases, and a couple of concluding remarks. As you know, the term principal contradiction is one that just about every Chinese has grown familiar with since the days of primary school. Many of us have learned this phase through our exploration of the ideas of Karl Marx, who taught that contradictions, dynamically opposing forces, are omnipresent in society and drive social change. In China, it is understood that the principal contradictions are the ones that define a society. By I, addressing and resolving them, society develops peacefully in harmony. If left unresolved, the principal contradiction can lead to instability, chaos, and even revolution. The principal contradiction, while typically elliptical and ambiguous, frames a rich discussion of risks and opportunities, strategies and, and tactics, reforms and governments, all of which will shape China's prospect for the foreseeable future. Since the dawn of the new China, it has become the task of the Communist Party to identify the principal contradictions, to continually access its relevancy in the light of social evolution and realities, to craft policies in response, and in this way, as the environment changes, so do the principal, or so does the principal contradiction. Soon after the founding of the People's Republic of China, the principal contradiction was expressed as the people versus imperialism, feudalism, and the remnants of the Kuomintang forces. This fueled discord between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and engendered a prolonged social turmoil across the nation. Three decades later, in 1981, the CPC updated its assessment and the principal contradiction was expressed to the ever-growing material and cultural needs of the people versus a backward social production. The efforts to resolve this contradiction resulted firstly in historic policy shifts which led the way to an unprecedented era of reform and opening up. Market economics reform. This transition was the key to transforming production and processes. After a period of, un of adjustment to an unprecedented novelty, China at first crept, then leapfrogged up uh, the supply chain from produce, producer of the cheaply made cheap to among the leaders in the leading edge of what might be called the third industrial revolution. At this moment, when the CPC 19th Congress was held under the theme, remain true to our original aspiration and keep our mission firmly in mind, hold high the banner of socialism with Chinese characteristics, secure a decisive victory in the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects, strive for greater success of socialism with China's characteristics, for a new area, work tirelessly to realize the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. President Xi Jinping voiced the third principal contradiction in the 60th year of the People's Republic of China. What we now face is the contradiction between unbalanced and adequate development and the people's ever-growing need for a better life. As each of us has heard and read these lines, each of us has labored to understand their meaning and their impact that they will have not only on the future of China, but the implications they will have for all of us. Before leaving this chapter, I would like to add one more thought expressed by President Xi. We call upon the people of all countries to work together to build a community with a shared future for mankind, to build an open, inclusive, clean, and beautiful world that enjoys lasting peace, universal security, and common prosperity. Again, as each of us struggles uh, with this call and its implied commitment, it is good to remember that we are not alone in this search and in the, the exploration is not the private domain of political thinkers, scholars, and journalists. Today across China, literally thousands of study groups are exploring the report of Mr. Xi to the 19th Congress, 
as well as the current and ensuing deliberations and the policies that will follow. What is the role of this national effort, this national discussion, this national debate? It is up to each of us to make a judicious assessment and perhaps to set metrics against which behavior and progress can be measured. Personally, I have a question that is right at the heart of the theme of our conference, un Integral Human Development, Challenges to Sustainability and Democracy. Could this process play an enabling role in the challenge or rather the imperative expressed by Federico Mayor Zaragoza in his call from subject to citizens, the great transition. On this point, as on almost all points in this discussion, each of us will have our own view, and from this comes the beauty and the power of diversity, as we search not so much to criticize the past, but to find resources to allow us to move forward. The section chapter of our conversation will be concise, but I am certain not without controversy. For the sake of consistency, I would like to draw liberally from a paper tabled by Minister Hugh De Ping, which I had the honor of presenting on his behalf at a colloquium on Laudato Si, which was held last year at the Vatican under the aegis of the Pontifical C Council for Justice and Peace, which no longer exists, and the Pontifical Academy of Science. As a result of the efforts to resolve the first two contradictions, and despite many difficulties and setbacks, the progress made by China in eradication, starvation, alleviating prof, uh, poverty is one of the great accomplishments of huma humanity and one that owes not only much to a grand vision and the labors of the Chinese people, but to the selfless contribution of institutions from around the world. There is an ancient proverb that states, when you drink sweet water from the well, never forget those who have helped you build it. Let me assure you that the Chinese have a long, long memory. And one of the reasons that we participated in this colloquium was really to honor and to learn more about the Jesuit missionaries who came to China and had a tremendous role in helping China to find its approaches and culture. And that is something that today is still recognized by all Chinese leaders. Of course, this path was not smooth or linear. Alan Piazza of John Hopkins University summarized that the trend in poverty and living standards in China were mixed during the period from 1949 to 1978. In the 1950s and 70s, the more egalitarian distribution and increased production of food combined with improvements in access to basic education and public health reduced poverty and improved living standards. During the Great Leap period, uh, forward period, 1959 to 1962, however, the collapse of food production and the failure to take corrective measures led to widespread famine of historic proportions and a sharp decline in living standards. With the advent of reform and opening, the identification of a new principal contribution and national effort and a national goal being expressed in the single word, Xiao Kang. Xiao Kang translates to small well-being or from those, what, that one word, what is meant is a moderately prosperous society for all. As a and that Xiao Kang is a fundamental requirement for the evolution towards a harmonious society. As we can appreciate uh, and see even more clearly with the benefit of hindsight, this shift in direction for a giant fast-moving entity was fraught with challenges, barriers and perils, and demanded time and care to effect. It required total refocusing, embracing of new sets of values, identifying new priority structures. It necessitated building awareness and enhancing education. It required the adoption the creation and adoption of new technologies, and above all, it could only succeed with strong government leadership, policies, and above all, a strong buy-in and commitment of the people. As progress was being made against the goals of hunger and eradication, eradication and poverty alleviation, the ancient concept of Xiao Kang uh, 
was enhanced with the insight that a relatively well-off society for all could only be achieved and maintained if due attention and care was, pray, was prayed to nature. And the development must be uh, beneficial, to be beneficial must be truly inclusive and truly sustainable. Flowing from this and the insistence that development must be people-centered, China understood the, new, the need to focus on the national long-term task of building a harmonious society and the understanding that to be truly and enduringly harmonious, it must not only extend beyond the borders of China and include all people of the world, but it must of all be, it, include harmony between human beings and nature. To close this chapter, allow me to very briefly uh, outline the position of the United Nations looking at China's performance on the Millennium Development Goals. In the report of the UNDP, uh, they highlighted that China in, achieved uh, something special in five areas. First, achieving rapid economic growth, steadily improving the overall agricultural production capacity and making significant progress in the eradication of hunger and poverty. Fully achieving nine-year compulsory education, steadily increasing employment, basically achieving gender equality in, gen in education and employment. Number three, constantly improving medical health services. Number four, reversing the trend of sustained loss in environmental resources, uh, increasing the number of people with access to clean drink drinking water by over 500 million, and fully launching government subsidized housing projects. Number five, offering support and help to 120 uh, developing nations for them to achieve their MDG goals under the framework of South-South capacity building. As a general comment on the environmental targets, the report, the UNDP report states, from 2000, that China fully included the principle of sustainable development into the national economy and social development planning. And as a result, the general ecological system has taken a turn for the better. During his first term as president, Mr. Xi Jinping gave voice to the national vis vision, China's dream. It was a dream of a prosperous lifestyle reconciled with a sustainable lifestyle. To bridge the gap between the reality of today and his dream, it was understood to require radical restruction where the needs of the people and nature are the fundamental concern at the heart of development, where green technology is promoted and widespread conspicuous con consumption is reduced. Flowing from a shared understanding that everything is closely related and today's problems call for a uh, vision capable of considering every aspect of the global crisis. The basic concept encoded in the term integral ecology is deeply embedded in China's direction and, uh, and approaches as it has been ingrained in the deep culture and the spirit of the Chinese people. Pope Francis once described our destruction of the environment as a sin that is turning our planet into a polluted wasteland full of debris, desolation, and filth. These strong words and powerful description ring true in China, where it is understood that the words are not about some distant future, but the impacts of environmental degradation, climate change, the destruction of ecosystems and biodiversity loss are becoming clear to all as the fact that even in the short term, the less privileged member of society, the poor are the most and most cruelly affected. Around the globe, China, in China it is becoming clear that the resolve to live differently should affect our various uh, contributions to shaping culture and society in which we live. China understands that the political, social, and scientific, academic, and business leaders must stop thinking in terms of short-term gain, must work for the common good. In China, as in the rest of the world, this conversion is neither easy nor fast, but a process that demands the involvement of all. Looking forward to 2030, as, as uh, Professor Sox mentioned yesterday, in harmony with the Sustainable Development Goals, China has set forth the following strategic directions. 
eradication of poverty and hunger through targeted measures to alleviate and eliminate poverty, enhancing agricultural production and food security, implementing innovation development strategies and generating momentum for sustainable health and economic growth, advancing industrialization to inject the impetus of development between urban and rural areas among the three sustainable development uh, goals, improving social security and social services to ensure adequate and equal access to all basic public services, safeguarding equity and social justice to improve the people's well-being and promoting all around human development, protecting the environment and building uh, protective barriers for eco security, addressing climate change actively and integrating uh, climate change responses into the national development strategies, promoting uh, utilization of resources and sustainable energy, improving national governance and ensuring economic and social uh, development. Could this program be seen really as a step towards integral human development? Let's not debate it. Let's ask Francis what he thinks about this. China views the implementation of the 2030 Agenda as a systemic pr project which will demand the proactive involvement and collaboration of all stakeholders. Before moving to the next chapter, I would like to cite former Chen Secretary General Kofi Annan's thought on harmony. And he expressed these in Beijing not so long ago. He recalled that the Analects of Confucius share, uh, quote, harmony is the beautiful way. And he quoted the African pro proverb, in harmony, everything succeeds. Kofi Annan continued, from these references, we can see that the search for harmony is an eternal human quest but it has often been frustrated by man's thirst for wealth and power. I, Kofi Annan, have arrived at the conviction that harmony is grounded in three mutually supporting pillars, peace and security, sustainable and inclusive development, human rights, and the rule of law. I believe that these are foundations of a successful society, even though I recognize that every society has its own unique characteristics. And as I read his words and I was there when he spoke them, I was thinking about Ubuntu. And perhaps I am we is really the fundamental thought behind harmony. Now, I ask you, does China have a right to talk about itself? Of course, every child, woman, and man has a right to talk about themselves. Does China have a right to be listened? I believe it does. Uh, does China have some authority? Well, if you look back at what has happened since 1949 to today and compare the development, the social, the cultural development of China in that time compared to just about every country of the world, then I think China does have some right to express its opinions. In our third chapter, I would like to share with you uh, three studies that will provide practical food for thought and understanding of our topics towards Xiao Kang. The first is the Guanchai program. The Guanchai program was created in the 1990s by 10 young entrepreneurs. And in fact, Zhou Jin Feng, the co-author of this paper, was one of the 10 and the leader of the gang. Private businessmen and women who understood that they shared in the responsibility of eradicating hunger and poverty in their country and chose to fulfill this responsibility through facilitating the development of sustainable enterprises in the poorest areas of China. An NGO was created, the China so Society for the Promotion of the Guanchai Program. And Guanchai translates as glory. And their idea was that the glory of China is that everybody should participate in the prosperity of the country. And that NGO still oversees the project today. From its very origin, the Guanchai program was fully integrated into China's overriding goal of building a Xiao Kang society, which envisions economic, social, and environmental well-being for all Chinese citizens. 
It represents a multifaceted approach to reduce structural violence by changing structures through impacting existing dominant logic, utilizing and building on existing social capital, creating and nurturing networks, and developing effective inter-network links. The model is firmly grounded both on moral and business foundations. It questions the dominant logic, especially with regard to the interaction between society and the poor. It is based on the concept of respect for and the effective participation of all relative stakeholders. Above all, the success of the model stems from its harmony with China's deep culture, its effective and multifaceted returns gained through empowerment and the support and natural propensity for collaboration. The program is based on a profound and proactive respect for the unique ca capabilities of each partner in the project and commit a commitment to the well-being of each stakeholder. The program is a conscientious of, a conscious of the overriding importance of social, environmental, and economic uh, sustainability. The program understands and acts uh, in accordance with the fundamental importance of information symmetry, uh, meaningful and equitable incentives. And when we say incentive, of course, we don't mean financial incentives only, but there are so many incentives that drive us, including a smile, a thank you, recognition for what we have done. It, it, this is part of, the, of, the, of the, the power of this project and the effective monitoring and feedback as well as conflict minimization and resolution. The model is extremely simple and you can see it on, on the thing where in, in this case, uh, the company, government, and non-governmental organizations and farmers work together. Uh, while this uh, particular description is of uh, agriculture, this has worked in many, many different areas. Uh, the farmer has his or her labor, his or her skills, the land and wants income, tools, risk reduction, and more skills. The company has capital, funds, market experience, and wants income and reduced risk. It also wants to participate in a program in the, in the goals of the government. The government has the capacity to provide infrastructure and support. It wants social and economic development as well as peace and stability. The NGO has neutrality and provides and wants to support social and economic development. The outcome 23 years later and counting. Over the years, tens of thousands of, pri Chin of private Chinese companies have and are still proactively engaged in the Guansai program, which is credited with helping more than 20 million Chinese sustainably, sustainably leave the ranks of the poor, improving agriculture and industrial production, especially in the poorest regions of the, of the country. Uh, 20 million, of course, is a very, very small number in China. But the, the example that this model that the 20 million people have given has really promoted the kind of development that we would like to see in China. I'd now like to go to the second uh, case. Uh, the China uh, uh, Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Federation, I'd like to, 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 to chat about two different projects. One is called uh, the CCAFA, and the other one is called EPIL. The first one is the China, I'm sorry, the Citizens Conservation Action for Something Somewhere. And EPIL is an approach to sue corporations, to sue the government, in order to ensure that development is being done properly. First, a little bit about the CCAFA. China has a rich biodiversity boasting large number of, of bird species, genosperm varieties, but China diversity is facing critical challenges. 
as that was the one area in the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, where China did not 100% reach its thing. The China Diversity uh, Biodiversity Conservation Green Development Foundation has developed and tested and implementing a timely and comprehensive saleable and scalable and sustainable approach to ensure uh, the conservation of endangered species, of endangered trees, of endangered uh, relics. Uh, and in partnership with relevant organization is committed to the collaboration. Let, let uh, uh, see if we can go, go forward. Can we move the, the slide? Okay. Uh, so th this is the, the, the thing, and let's see if I can, okay. Uh, I won't go into a long introduction, but basically what the, this does is it empowers people. It, it understands or allows people to express what is valuable to them and then provides them with support so that they can take action, they can join. And right now there are f about 50 or 60 uh, pro projects in China involving roughly 5,000 people. And this number of projects is growing very, very rapidly. Uh, it's based on two pillars, the understanding and respect for the knowledge and comparative advantage of each of the partners. If you recall, this sounds very much like the Guansai project, and it, it does. And it's not a coincidence because that is within the culture of the Chinese people. The deep culture of the Chinese people, which includes their proactive respect and love for nature, as well as the predisposition for collaborative efforts and community involvement. Our son, who lives in China, worked for a tea company. And he said, well, Dad, I'm working on the human rights side, but I don't have very much to do on the environmental side. These trees have been around for a thousand and more years. People understand the environment. Uh, the starting point of the CCAFA project is the recognition at the local level of an environmental and biodiversity conservation problem or opportunity, as well as the local determination uh, and commitment to actively address the situation. I just will pass a few, a number of, of the different projects so you can see, see the kinds of things that are a thing. And uh, before I go to the, uh, this, the EPIL, a little while ago, we realized that China has a tremendous amount of wind farms that were not being used. They were there, beautiful towers, big windmills, not being used. And the question was why, and what was happening is that the, the, the power distribution companies, which are owned by the government, state-owned companies, were buying their energy from coal-fired plants rather than from the wind farms. And it was a very simple thing. Citizens came together and started to sue the state distribution companies on the basis of you should give equal opportunity to other producers of energy. And they said, well, yeah, but we're part of the state and these, these coal producing, uh, these, these coal generated producing, uh, they're part of the state too, so we should favor them. But we said, whoa, 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 just a second. Go back and look at what Mr. Xi Jinping is talking about in terms of environment. And so these, these suits are being now successful. And what we're finding is that coal powered plants are being shut down and the energy production is being transferred more and more to, to wind farms. So th this shows that the power of the people is there. The power of NGOs is extraordinarily strong. Uh, I'd like to th now shift to, uh, we, we cooperate with anybody, even Jesuits. The Chinese and, and, and number one Jesuit uh, really is also the bridge builder in chief, the world's build bridger in chief. And I think the level of dialogue between Francis, between the Vatican and China is very difficult because many people don't want it. 
they see barriers, but other people don't see barriers, they see the possibility for bridges. And this is to, I think, the whole world a tremendous opportunity that is opening up to us. I'd like to go to, to the, the following thing. This is the third and final case study, and it starts off with, the, with Africa. Uh, but if you look at this map, you'll see that childhood stunting is a problem that exists in many places of the world. India, roughly 48% of all children under five are stunted. Stunting is a terrible thing because it's not only physical stunting and mental stunting, but it can't be repaired. And one looks forward, and if you think when you have 50% or 48% of the children under five, what will the India be like, what will Africa be like with 37% 20 years from now, when these children become adults, those who survive? The, the tremendous uh, tragedy is there. So an NGO group decided, what can we do about it? Writing declarations is nice. Demanding things at the UN is nice. But what could we do about it? So a group of people got together and said, what could we do about it? How, because educating people that have no brains doesn't really work. Trying to find work for people that are stunted doesn't work. So we have to attack the basic problem. And stunting is one that everybody can understand because it's visual. We have a hard time to understand hunger because we don't experience hunger, or at least very few of us do. But we, we can see with our own eyes, with our own heart, what stunting is. And so a group of people got together and said, OK, what could we do about stunting? And this idea came up of something called the African Orphan Crop Consortium. The, the leader is a very interesting guy. I have to gather, he's Jewish from his name, but he looks like Santa Claus, the chief scientist of a, an American company called Mars, who, working on, on cocoa in Africa, realized the plight of, of stunting. And he decided to do something about it and created this, uh, what he calls, uncommon collaboration. And what, what was decided is, how could the farmers, the small lot farmers in, in Africa who are responsible for feeding roughly 600 million people, what could improve them? So a process was created. BGI, which I work with, uh, looks at the seeds of 156 different crops that are basic, the food of Africa, and works with them to define them from a genomics point of view. That then goes from a place in China, in Shenzhen, to uh, uh, agricultural academies in almost every country of China, uh, of Africa. And those academies are supported by the consortium in terms of development of people and developments of technology to produce better seeds. And those seeds then go to small seed farmers, as, as, uh, small seed developers, who then sell the seeds to local farmers. That's the only place where any funds take place because uh, while we can support the, the headquarter thing and we can support the national academies, we cannot support in each individual seed breeder. For the farmer, it's a good deal because the seeds that they acquire from the seed breeder are better seeds which allow them higher quality and higher quantity production of food, which lowers the cost of food and increases the quality of the food that people get. So th this is the basic concept of the, of the afternoon. Before you, you, you ask the question, no, GMO is not involved. Uh, BGI has found much better ways to develop better seeds, better uh, health things than using GMO. 
Uh, these are the crops, the, the three basic ones, and those of you from Africa will certainly recognize finger millet, pigeon pea, and spider plants, but there's about 101 other plants besides these. By the way, one of the great reasons that China has moved ahead in terms of, of uh, elimination of, of hunger uh, and poverty has been millet. And millet, which is a 7,000-year-old crop, uh, has become one of the mainstays of, of, of the China agricultural thing, and it's all small lot farmers. This is the pipeline. These are the achievements, and he, these are the people that are involved. And it's, it's interesting, there's not one food producing company in the group. There, it's a very uncommon collaboration. But it's an NGO where China has said, we have a responsibility to help. But we can't help, we can't tell people what to do. All we can do is provide support. So if you look back at the Biodiversity Foundation, if you look back at the Guansai, it's really a grassroots from the base where people and all people are receiving is just a little bit of support, a little bit of encouragement, and a feeling that they can participate and draw. And this, I go back is the basis of creating a really harmonious society. So I'd just like to conclude a uh, very thing. In addressing significant challenges, the eradication of, of uh, poverty in some of China's least uh, favored regions, the protection of community assets against powerful despoilers, and the eradication of hunger and malnutrition in sub-Saharan Africa, these three cases show a deep reliance on the culture of the Chinese people, which is reflected both in the acceptance of empowerment uh, with all of its responsibilities and the proactive appreciation of the value and joy of collaboration. Of course, it will be noticed that these characteristics that we have explored under the microscope of three small projects that are, are successfully tapped tackling heretofore intractable challenges, also played an unmistakable role in the overall and unprecedented, unprecedented development of China since the dawn of the new nation, and will remain fundament of fundamental importance as China seeks the path to uh, harmony. We must regain the conviction that we need one another, that we have a shared responsibility for each other and for the world. That, as I'm sure you all recognize, are the words of Pope Francis. Thank you very much.